The world is at an inflection point, and governments play a crucial role in the future of people and the planet, either positive or negative. If governments do not set out on positive pathways, then there is a real risk that future generations will be faced with an even more dire situation. This is where the future of government initiative comes in. It is critical to talk about the future of government now. Welcome to the first in a series of disruptive debates on the future of government. The general context uh, uh, for all of this is the fact that expectations of government, that was the topic of the first panel, have been rising faster than the uh, government's actual ability to uh, provide services. It's not necessarily that government is worse, uh, but um, uh, people's expectations are not uh, stable. Where we think about the role of the state, not so much as the things we would like the state to do, there are many that would be on that list, but what it has the capacity to do. Now, I like to think of those state capacities in, in, three, in three buckets. The first and, and, and obvious state capacity that we need is a state that can raise resources, because without resource, states really lack the capacity to do very much at all. Um, the second is what I like to call legal capacity. It's the ability of the state to underpin a flourishing market economy. And then the third, and, and of course this has been in the spotlight throughout the pandemic, is what I like to call collective capacity. The ability of the state to provide things to citizens when they need them, of the kind that they need. If governments uh, continue in the innovation and the, with the speed with which they worked earlier, um, if they continue to use the, the positive aspects of, the tra of this tragedy and this horrible pan pandemic to their advantage, they would succeed. Governments alone cannot deliver. They must partner with non-state actors to be able to meet the demand there is particularly in education, which is where we look to, to prepare young people who are able to lead countries to make good decisions and to hopefully be productive and grow the economies. How do we drive for a more efficient and more productive public service? We are really looking at how do we make sure that, you know, when we go high tech, we still want to make sure that we are very customer-centric, citizen-centric, and maintain that high touch. High tech, yet high touch. Do you have my best interests at heart? Do you, as a government, really care about me? Or are you more interested in staying in power, staying in government, and so therefore you use all sorts of tricks and things to make me feel like you care about me, but you actually just want to, to stay in government. So governments are going to have to demonstrate in real terms, real ways, that they actually have the citizens' best intentions uh, at heart. Trust is this glue that, that binds us into societies. If we trust that everyone is subject to the rule of law, regardless of who they are or who they know or their station in life, and if we trust that government represent common interests, then we can bypass the need to directly trust all of the diverse groups that we live alongside. And when that government trust fails, that's when we fall back on our individual in-groups. So our extended family, our friends, our ethnic and religious communities, local government, the local groups whom trust comes more naturally. Especially worrisome has been the widening of three types of gaps. The income gap, the digital gap, and the gender gap. So to prepare for crisis, governments first, I think, must design policies that first and foremost prevent the minimal and uneven impacts. For this, the closing of gaps must be placed at the center of recovery and development strategies. If we would suggest that after a crisis, the world typically as a short time to learn and put in place, you know, more strengthened international cooperation mechanism before the political attention moves on, you know. Now is the time to reimagine government. 
Join or continue the conversation on our website or on Twitter using the hashtag Future of Government or contact the Future of Government team directly. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Paul Blake. I'm an external affairs officer here at the World Bank Group, and I'll be your guide through today's program. I want to welcome everyone who's joining us around the globe online and those of you here in the room with us. And uh, very, very happy for us to be able to gather here in person after two years of the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, the pandemic hasn't just disrupted meetings like this. The effects have been far reaching. We're still fully understanding what the long-term effects of the pandemic are. But we, what we can say for sure this morning is that the impact of the pandemic alongside the need to meet climate change commitments, as well as the troubling rise of conflicts around the globe, have amplified the need for more effective governance, both at the, the central level all the way down to the local level. So what does that look like? How do we enable it? Those are just some of the questions we're hoping to answer today. The Future of Government Report, which is being published today, and a supporting website are a guide for governments and non-governmental actors to reimagine the role of the state in formulating policy, providing regulation, and delivering services for positive development outcomes. The report includes a call to action for those working in government, as well as those not working in government who wish to be effective agents of change, to start building coalitions for change now. We want today's program to be a two-way street, so please use the hashtag Future of Government. If you're online, please ask your questions in the live chat. Sam and Carlos are over there monitoring that. And if you're in the room, feel free to ask some questions. Uh, and as people trickle in, Tracy, if you'll encourage them to go to the mic, that would be great. Now, before that, let's take a deep dive into the future of the government report. And who better to do that than those who authored it? Donna Andrews is the global lead for public institutions reform in the governance global practice at the World Bank Group. She's typically here in Washington, DC, but is joining us today from Athens, Greece. And Tim Williamson is the global lead for public financial management here at the World Bank. And he is not joining us from Greece. He's joining us from here in Washington, DC. Donna and Tim, I'll turn it over to you now. Great, thanks, Paul. On behalf of the Future of Government team, I'd like to welcome everyone to this launch of the Future of Government report, Reimagining Government for Good. The journey to deliver, develop this report has really been a challenging one, um, but one that's seen us deliberately take an innovative and um, an unusual approach. So we've been engaging in a global conversation for the past 18 months on what the future of government could or should look like. We've convened a series of disruptive debates and we've invited a diverse range of speakers, including young leaders, activists and civil society actors, economists and political thinkers, public sector employees and politicians, as well as business people and entrepreneurs. So you've seen um, some of the debate highlights in the previous video. So we have been deliberately and perhaps provocatively posing questions that we know that there is not one single response to. As part of this Future of Government initiative, we've created a vision of the government of the future and contrasted this with what we know about the government of the past. So these contrasting pictures have been informed by what we've heard through the global conversations, as well as past evidence and research. So we know that governments of the past have been blind to context, have a litany of broken promises, have lurched from crisis to crisis, have enriched elites, resisted change and are often mistrusted. By contrast, the government of the future has clear direction. It's responsive to the demands of citizens, is able to influence and deliver. It's innovative and productive and is trusted and prepared for crisis. But every country is different and the government of the future looks different in every country. And there's no one size fits all. Every challenge faced by government is complex and governments must solve multiple challenges and meet citizen demands simultaneously. Government is hard. So how can governments start to reimagine themselves? The process of reimagining government starts with a social contract between government and its citizens. There is an opportunity to re-examine what governments do for their citizens and what citizens do for their governments. For a renewed social contract to be sustainable and effective, it needs to be supported by an elite bargain. Power, authority and resources that enable governments to function are typically concentrated in elites, not the broader citizenry, and therefore the deals reached by elites are critical for governments to deliver their social contract. 
For elite bargains to be developmental, it is critical that elites commit to outcomes that benefit the broader citizenry and society, not just themselves. So in renewing the social contract, we pose four quick key questions that governments can ask themselves. First, what is the role of government? Governments need to avoid trying to maximize what they can deliver on their own, and instead reimagine their roles taking into account their own capability and context. They need not always focus on provision, but look to their roles in regulation, leadership, and coordination. They consider how local and central government, the private sector, commun communities, and different genders can contribute together to achieve common objectives that respond to the needs of citizens. So how, how can government deliver? With a clear focus on the needs of the citizen, governments rethink how they deliver and who drives, enables, and ensures delivery, whether through regulation or provision. They unlock and build new capability, collaborate and ensure quality and equity in what is delivered. How can government be productive? Governments face pressure to do more with less and shun efficiency and waste. Governments need to identify and understand and confront the causes of inefficiency, identify solutions, be adaptive and exploit new technology. In doing so, they drive public and private sector productivity, whether in regulation, the workforce, in procurement, or in allocation and use of public finances. How can governments build trust? Governments at many levels and in many spaces have lost the trust of their citizens. Governments urgently need to start work to regain the trust, retrain trust by involving, responding to, and being accountable to citizens in decisions and delivery, by communicating well, by taking advantage of opportunities that technology presents, and by achieving what they commit to and being consistent in regulation and delivery. Next, we urge governments to embark on an urgent journey to deliver change. Change cannot be achieved through one comprehensive process. It requires multiple processes happening at different levels and in different sectors and in different spaces simultaneously. The first step involves seeking and creating, seeking, creating and taking advantage of opportunities for change. There are three dimensions to this. Firstly, this involves building teams, coalitions and the authorizing environment for change. Secondly, it involves innovation and the use of technology to address problems. Innovation does not mean choosing the most high-tech solution, but using available technology and capability in innovative ways to deliver change. Thirdly, we urge governments to proactively seek opportunities for using changing circumstances and crises as a fulcrum for, to advance change. So once the opportunity for change has been created, governments need to embark on the journey. First, by plotting pathways, which involves governments identifying and prioritizing the key challenges and demands they face. Setting a destination that is both achievable and ambitious, uh, and plotting, path, plotting the potential pathways towards it, and then jointly deciding on the destination and the route. Then by taking steps deliberately, along the route, moving towards a destination. They look and learn along the way. The journey will not go according to plan. So when necessary, and it will be necessary, governments will need to be flexible, nimble, and to adjust the route. The governments of the past have contributed to greater uncertainty, poverty, inequality, insecurity, and service delivery failures. It's critical for people and the planet that the governments of the future are prepared for crisis, deliver shared prosperity, secure livelihoods for their citizens, and avert climate change. Yet history has shown us that governments can successfully meet the challenges they face, no matter how severe, and change for good. The change is possible, even in the most challenging contexts. There are people in every country and in every government who can and do use the power, influence, and authority they have within and outside formal structures to deliver changes in government. So are you ready to take the first step now? How will you start a conversation about the government of the future? Do you want to tackle the learning crisis in schools or address gender gaps 
or perhaps you're interested in how to generate quality secure jobs or adapting to climate change. Perhaps you can start a conversation with your local government about vaccine hesitancy. The entry points to beginning reimagining government are everywhere. And we ask you to start that conversation today and take the first step of the journey now. And with that, Paul, back to you. Thank you, Donna, and thank you, Tim, for getting us up to speed with that inspirational message. Let's bring in our panel. Joining us remotely is Laura Chinchilla, the former president of Costa Rica. Also in line is George Werner, Liberia's former education minister. And rounding out our online participants, last but not least, is Lo Pek Kim, Chief HR Officer for the Singaporean Government. And here on stage, I want to, well, I already have up here, Ed Aloa Okiri, the Global Director for Governance here at the World Bank. Thank you so much for being here, Ed. And a friendly, friendly reminder to those of you joining us online and here at the bank, we want to hear your thoughts and questions. I'll start with a few of my own here over the next few minutes, and then we'll open up the floor, both virtually and here in person. But Ed, I'll start with you. The report is your brainchild. You were the one that said we need to start thinking seriously about the future of government. Tell us about the origins of this report. Why is this needed? And now that it's been produced, what are some of your key takeaways from it? Uh, thank you, Paul, for that, uh, I mean, interesting set of questions. <laughs> so let me start with the first uh, one. So why the future of government uh, uh, report or, or the work that we've done on, on this? Um, at the onset of the pandemic uh, in 2020, our focus really was on uh, helping government with policies uh, that they could adopt to really be able to ensure continuity uh, during the crisis, the COVID crisis, and be able to continue to deliver on the, what government was expected to do. Uh, but at a point, we realized that, look, um, uh, this is a perfect opportunity for, for change. Uh, especially when you look at the multiple crises, I think it created a, 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 a perfect storm uh, that then could lead to uh, serious uh, changes in government. And we know from past experience that uh, crises are provided in Pentos for, for change. So as a result of that, we thought, well, uh, change will happen, but the real question is, how can this be a better change? Okay like what it, uh, we are advocating, reimagining of government. And how can this be done in a way that we really learn from what has happened in the past in terms of what worked, what didn't work? And how can we ensure that uh, whatever it is, the change that is being done, that it really is focused on delivering better uh, for the citizen. And um, then in terms of the process of making that change, how can we ensure that uh, it's, uh, it's something that uh, really learns from the past in terms of what works and what does not work? And so that was really the context, okay? So we really want to be able to accompany government on a transformation or change that will happen, but to make sure that the change is done in a way that is focused on the citizen and also learn from uh, the past. Now, in terms of my takeaway from the various uh, disruptive uh, debates uh, that have taken place, I think there is a lot, but I think I'll focus this on a few. Uh, Briefly, those debates, they've been happening over the past few weeks with some of our panelists today, is that right? Yes, uh, with, I mean, all the panel members, I think they participated in the, in the debates. I, we had like about seven or eight uh, uh, debates, and there are, I mean, are much more as well, because there were some other debates that were done focusing on sectors and regions, and the debates are still continuing anyway. <laughs> yeah. Better to catch the replay of those <laughs> okay. on the World Bank website. Yeah. So now in terms of my takeaway from the, uh, from the various uh, disruptive debates, uh, first is that uh, uh, governments must realize that they really have a more enlightened and demanding citizens now. I mean, it's the, it's not just developed world, but even in the developing countries. I think the emergence of civil society organization, the social media, and so on and so forth, has just transformed uh, uh, citizens uh, in terms of their understanding and expectation of, uh, of government. And uh, uh, I mean, I was listening to some of the speakers, and you can see a new concept of government and citizens uh, emerging in terms of their relationship, like 
panelists more or less describing government as a service provider and citizens as a customer. And you know, the relationship between a customer and the, uh, and the service provider will be different than what we currently see as government and, and citizens. Then also is the point that uh, citizens' expectations of governments are now higher, okay? Uh, is th this is not just about what governments will be delivering, okay? Of course, citizens have higher expectation of gov what governments will deliver, but how government delivers is also very important. Then, also the realization from the debate that government cannot expect to deliver alone. They must partner with other service uh, providers, and I have a few more points. Uh, the, also, the point on technology. Technology does hold a promise. Okay, can help government to be able to better deliver and deliver more efficiently. And also, there was the issue of trust. I think that came, uh, that came through a lot, uh, especially the multidimensional aspect of trust. Trust is not just about delivery. A government can deliver, but how government deliver in terms of involvement of citizens and responsiveness to citizens, transparency, accountability is also very important. Uh, then also finally, in terms of my other takeaway from the disruptive debate is uh, it is now time to prepare for the next crisis. I mean, the time to prepare for the next crisis is now, not later. Now, uh, from this report, just for me to, to, to conclude uh, my intervention, uh, my takeaway from this report really is that governments have accomplished a lot uh, in the last, I mean, the past decades uh, on various fronts, whether it's uh, social infrastructure and so on, or economic, but there is still a lot of scope for governments to improve and to be able to meet the demands of the citizens. Uh, so. That pre kind of presents uh, an opportunity for transformation or the reimagining of government that the uh, report is calling for. Uh, but reimagining of government, this really has to be done in a systematic way. Uh, and that begins with a, uh, with, a re with a focus on the social contract. That is a contract between the state and the citizens. Then uh, also another takeaway is really the what of the transformation. Okay, yeah, we are ask, I mean, there is opportunity for transformation, but what? What is the content of that? Okay, and the, from the report, my takeaway is that this, the word of the transformation has to be contextual. Okay, uh, drawing on the history of a particular country, where a country is in the journey, and also putting the citizens of that country at the center of the transformation. Um, then a, talk, I mean, a fourth takeaway is really the how of that transformation. Uh, it's not just about government implement, formulating changes and implementing them. It's really also about working with the citizens, building coalitions, and doing this in a very collaborative uh, uh, way. And finally, is the importance of learning lessons as the, change, the transformation is taking place, and then be really open to making costs adjustment or cost correction. Thank you. And, and you're talking about lessons from the past there, and, and you mentioned some of the, the positive accomplishments that good government governance can achieve. I'm curious, Laura Chinchilla, having looked at the report, the report looks back over the past century at some of these achievements of good government governance. What stood out to you of, of, from the report of those accomplishments? What what are some of the highlights of good governance over the past century? And, and if George and uh, Pat Kim or, or Ed, if you want to jump in after Laura, please feel free. Uh, well, thank you for having me and congratulations on the report. Uh, I'll say that the report highlights uh, very clear the contributions of governments to the development of many nations during the past century and recognizes very clear that governments have been successful. And I would say that this is undeniable and is confirmed by different indicators in terms of economic growth, human development, social progress, institutional building, among others. And there are some major, especially some major accomplishments, including, for example, the reduction of poverty or the access to fundamental services like education or health, or the reducing of some of the gender gaps However, rather than focusing on a particular achievement, 
I would like to draw attention to the capacity of some governments to generate economic growth while at the same time assuring a fair income distribution in the context of globalization. We find moments in history when governments were able to put in place the right combination of policies that trigger economic growth and modernization, strengthen the middle class, and reduce both income and wealth inequalities. Uh, those were the cases of the United States and Europe in past decades, but also the case of Latin America during the first decade of this century. But this is not the situation today. The report recognizes that inequality in global income and wealth distribution had increased over the past two decades, and it's affecting both developed and developing countries. Inequality is reinforcing feelings of social injustice and, in, and exclusion among the population, and is becoming a source of unrest, political discontent, and distrust in government. So to respond to this major challenge to development, governments around the world should consider those accomplishments that effectively tackle the disparities in income distribution in a context of uh, economic growth. Uh, if one of the major concerns, and i about to finish, if one of the major concerns of governments right now is how to encourage recovery strategies for inclusive growth, they must identify those kind of policies. Uh, once again, that can simultaneously foster economic dynamism, improve human development, and reduce inequality. Laura, thank you so much. George, the, the report doesn't just look at accomplishments, but it also looks at, at failings. Um, as someone who, who has quite a lot of expertise about government, what sort of behaviors have stood out to you? What would you propose that governments need to leave behind in order to, to avoid repeating the mistakes of the past? So um, thank you. Thank you for the beautiful report, which represents uh, the the debates. <laughs> so, um, look, as Laura has said, our past, why imperfect, uh, presents us with so many uh, successes. Uh, we made progress. And I like to speak of progress uh, when I talk about public service, not perfection. Uh, but uh, as the report points out, uh, we risk a reversal to the progress given all that is happening around us. In, in the Mano River Union, that is Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, we've had Ebola, which was very disruptive uh, in every way. Uh, our economies, our education, our healthcare systems. And on the global level, now you have COVID. So the global community is experiencing what the Mano River Union experienced uh, in 2014, 2015, there about. So one of the things that I believe must happen, as the report points out, is uh, for changing minds and attitudes. Um, government needs to, first of all, recognize that we do have a problem, <laughs> and then define that problem. It will call a lot for the way people think, the way people act, and it will call for collective action and we would not be, governments cannot go it alone. It must be people-centered. So changing your posture, the tone, the way we react, the way we prepare for, is not going to be just about the ruling parties or the ruling government. It would include those in opposition. It would include civil society. Because we learned from Ebola and from this pandemic that we are all bind together, and that for one to be safe, all of us have to be safe. So collective action, changing the tone, um, assessing what is preparing together, and moving forward together will be a new kind of way of changing behaviors for governments for the future. And, and Pat Kim or, or Laura, do you want to get in on that? What's needed looking forward? You know, I, if I may uh, add on, um, I think some of the things which 
the government have uh, been successful in the past and you know taking a quite iron-fisted role to say you know I tell you to jump you just ask how high uh, that's not going to work in today's context and, and I think um, the COVID situation has really taught us the importance of collaboration working as a team and cohesion and when we look at um, the last two years of managing the pandemic I think one of the key values of uh, teamwork uh, cannot be underestimated uh, as in you know we used to have different agencies or different uh, government that kind of want to hang on to their own resources and not share those resources uh, because it's very difficult to get especially the human resources uh, but when COVID struck and some areas are more in need for example healthcare uh, and so on and so forth uh, you can see that everybody's guards are down and we came together because we have a common purpose to say that this is how we are going to tackle the problem and this is how we're going to go at it together and together we can come out of the crisis stronger than before so some of that very uh, bureaucratic way of doing things are things that i think we need to leave behind and pick up new skills and new muscles which we have built over the last two years of being a lot more agile and really looking at a resource or a talent not just as a warm body with uh, only a set of resources but really how we can better tap on them to do other kind of work apart from their job description so to speak you're talking there about building coalitions and teams and in the video we played at the beginning of the event you were also talking about high tech and high touch uh, using innovation and technology yes. and, and learning from crises to make governments better that's something that ed said at the very start of the event it, Peck, just just staying with you for a moment of all of this is it possible to say what's the most important is it possible to say what should be prioritized uh, you know, to, to improve opportunity, improve the livelihoods of, of citizens? For me, I think utmost importance is trust. <laughs> I think we have invested so much in making sure that, you know, in managing the crisis, uh, we have thrived to be very transparent with the citizens um, and we wanted to build a very high level of trust. So as in all countries, we have, you know, some call it circuit breaker, some call it uh, lockdown and so on and so forth. But we wanted to bring our citizens and our businesses together with us in the journey. So every report, every day in the papers, um, we actually report, the government actually reports how many new cases how many in the hospital, what's the capacity, how many uh, are in ICU and how many have passed on and how these measures that we are taking, whether putting on masks, how will it reduce the chances of uh, infection and vaccination, how will it help uh, and how to encourage the, the elderly especially and the vulnerable to go and take their vaccination. So, so in order to build that collaboration, and the cohesiveness and to get everyone to embark on the journey together. To me, the key element is trust and how do you build that trust? Ed, did you want to jump in on this? Yeah, I, I fully agree uh, that uh, the trust element uh, is important. Uh, and I also agree with what uh, the speakers have said in terms of, about, uh, in terms of the accomplishment of governments. Uh, but I want to raise one fundamental uh, point and that is uh, when I look at countries across the globe, I think there has been uh, a situation where governments have taken for granted what citizens want and how they want it. Okay, so in, and I don't think what citizens want, their top priorities, that they are necessarily exactly the same from one country to another. Uh, and so if, if governments can just simply focus on really involving, engaging with citizens, really knowing what they want, how they want it, and really in what I would describe as co-creation, working with them on how, uh, I think we will have 
uh, better uh, delivery from government, we will have more trust from citizens in government as well. I was, I was struck by what you said uh, in your if remarks I, at the beginning. I, yeah. yeah, George, please. Yes, I, I just want to, yes, trust, and I like the comments, but I, I think that uh, one can raise the trust level from the national to the regional and to the international. If you saw behaviors of governments across the globe during the pandemic, with vaccines being heard by one uh, when many countries were not vaccinated, then it raises questions about trust transnationally. So we shouldn't just talk about trust within nations. We should trust. We should talk about trust between nations as we speak about new alliances, new partnerships. We need to rebuild trust within the multilateral system. We need to be, rebuild trust within the regional system and in the national system, the national levels. So you know, when those uh, connections are made, how, for example, the World Bank speaks to its local counterparts, how the IMF behaves within countries or reacts to events, these particular levels of trust will either engender a situation where people trust their governments or don't trust their government and or where there can be people-to-people -people relationships across the globe, thereby engendering more trust. So I just wanted to push that factor about legitimacy in trust that is existing at the national, international levels within multilateral systems and within regional uh, organizations. And Ed, I was struck in your comments a few minutes ago, you were talking about governments can deliver services, but it's how they're delivered. How much of this comes down to, to communicating the accomplishments of governments and, and helping people understand that, that good governments are competent, they can, I'm thinking of things like vaccine hesitancy, communicating to people that this is why this is important, both for the individual and for the collective. How much of this is a communications issue as well as a just service delivery issue? Okay. Uh, I, I think communication is part of it. Uh, uh, and uh, that communication, but it has to be two ways, okay? So governments are really communicating in the first instance with citizens to understand what they want. And then when they are providing what citizens want, then also communicating that, which is the communication part that you are talking about, but it needs to be two ways. But then the point I was also making really is that in many of the countries, I think, governments are taking for granted what citizens want. They need to understand what citizens want. And the way they can understand that is the one aspect of communication, which is about really finding ways to really come hear from the citizens what is it that they want. Uh, but also in terms of this trust, I think when you look at the way trust can be built, uh, I think Cities, governments also need to find ways to really involve citizens in the process of designing what is to be delivered and also communicating thereafter what has been delivered. Okay. And, and that's, a, that's a perfect segue to a question we've, we've just gotten from a, a viewer on Facebook. And maybe, Laura, you might be best place to, to answer this one and if anyone else wants to jump in. And the, the person was asking, how do we retrain citizens of yesterday for the government of the future? How can the citizen understand, adapt, and reinvent their understanding of governments looking forward? Um, I would say that, and, and this is based, of course, in my experience, that as uh, uh, the other members of the panel have underlined, uh, it is very difficult to have a successful uh, outcome from government if we do not count on the people. Um, the people have to trust what you are doing. And, and, and that has to do not only uh, with concerns about the efficient and trying to deliver uh, and to respond to the demands, but most importantly, they need to feel part of the process of change. Uh, they need to, uh, to, uh, to feel that they are being part of the uh, uh, decision-making process. They are no longer kind of passive uh, recipients of the services 
and the outputs that the governments provide. Um, I can give you, for example, very concrete experiences. Uh, here in my country, we were very successful or have been very successful uh, in all the sustainability agenda. And when people ask me uh, why we have been able to be successful, I would say that beyond the specific policies that we enacted uh, more than 60 years ago, what, what has been most important is that people, uh, they, 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 they are really uh, the ones who have become the defenders of the process. It doesn't matter if the government changes, it doesn't matter if there are some special interest group defending some kind of industry, the voice of the people uh, is being heard, um, you know, even, even louder than any other voice. Now, right now we have an advantage and that is the digital technologies because those technologies allow us to better communicate with the people. We can uh, also opening many different uh, channels for people to participate in the decision-making processes. So there are not excuses. If you have the uh, political willing, uh, you, you, you can do it because you already have uh, this social media and the possibilities through digital technologies to include people in the decision-making process. It's really interesting what you're saying there, making sure citizens aren't just kind of passive recipients of, of change, but making them feel like they're, they're actively involved and they're helping shape the future of government. I'm wondering, George or Pat Kim, how do you enable that? How do you make people feel like, and, and, and not just feel like, but actually participate in the shaping of the government of the future? If I could uh, jump in, um, I think in Singapore, we emphasize quite a fair bit on uh, making Singapore a smart nation. So to your earlier question of, you know, how do you make sure that the citizens come along with you? Uh, so we actually make available some of these digitization courses or IT courses, and we, we have a whole um, program called Skills Future in Singapore, where we give heavy subsidy up to 90% of the course fees for people to acquire the digital literacy that they require uh, in order to catch with the way at which the country is moving. So every single citizen also gets uh, $200, sing dollars of Skills Future funds where you can actually use to subsidize for, uh, to use for any of the courses that you want to attend. So apart from that, when we want to design um, things for the citizens, uh, back to Laura's point of, you know, make sure we bring the citizens along with us, uh, we actually have focus group uh, discussions with the citizens who participate in some of these focus group discussions. And as we come up with a solution, um, using technology as an enabler, uh, for example, we put most things in, in our mobile devices these days, uh, so much so that, you know, you have a live SG app where it actually follows you in terms of different moments of your life. So, for example, if you just had a baby, uh, you don't have to go to different places to register the birth and all that. Um, everything gets sent to you through your mobile app and, you know, it just saves you a lot of time. And we, we actually have uh, also what we call a million, dollar, a million hour challenge where we actually challenge our public officers to think of innovative ways where you can help save like a million hours uh, in a year. So in the last three years, we had like more than 900 projects uh, saving not just the public service, but also the citizens uh, more than 10 million hours in three years. Wow. So these are very grounds up initiative, which sometimes you think that, you know, you need to invest a lot of money in order to achieve this kind of savings, but it's not necessarily the case. And it could be as simple as, um, for example, today, if I'm going to renew my passport, I literally don't have to go to the immigration and uh, checkpoints authority. Uh, I just need to, you know, send everything online and and then the renewed passport gets sent to me 
uh, in an envelope. Very cool. Very cool. Sort of crowdsourcing ideas for more effective yeah. government. And, and George, uh, Pat Kim was, was talking at the beginning there about education, you being the, the former education minister, if I'm not mistaken, of Liberia. What role, and, and you were talking earlier about the importance of trust, what role does education play in helping build trust in government and, and also enabling people, as Laura was saying, to be active participants in, in their governments? So yes, both uh, Laura and Peck, they say, uh, look, trust, important, um, efficient and effective service delivery can uh, build trust with people. Uh, but in fact, in terms of education, one of the initiatives that countries like Liberia uh, picking up is civic education. Um, to teach people about their rights and responsibilities in, in, in a democracy like ours. But let me just add, one of the issues highlighted by this pandemic, I, I, I suppose in many developing countries, is the idea that I spoke to about digital literacy. I know countries in Africa whose cabinet decisions now have been made about digital transformation to give people the digital skills they need to navigate the, the modern workspace or even civil servants to deliver essential services. So education is being revamped across countries, uh, particularly in Africa, looking particularly at digital transformation, digital literacy, and civic education. And I want to acknowledge everyone who's joining us online on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Thank you so much for your, your questions and comments. And if you're just tuning in, uh, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag future of government. Share your thoughts and questions with us. We'll try to get them to Ed, George, Pat Kim, and Laura here over the next few minutes. We did get one other question, and, and perhaps Pat Kim is best place, but Ed, if you want to jump in on this. Uh, a viewer asked, does the future government need to raise cybersecurity awareness programs, especially for countries with citizens below the poverty level, as they are more social as they are socially more vulnerable and would be more affected by cyber attacks? Does that is there a sort of nexus there and in, in sort of cybersecurity to that trust? If, if if the future of government's going to be technology enabled, what role does, does cybersecurity play? Okay, uh, so I I think let me start by saying that uh, this is this will have nothing to do with the level of income, or whether you have uh, some countries that are in deep poverty and so no. I think in every country, cyber security will be important. I mean, it's just if you imagine what uh, uh, Singapore is currently doing and many other countries, and uh, you think of having much of what government does online. Uh, it then means that if you have somebody who is really kind of uh, uh, ready to attack a government, they can just simply shut the government down uh, by being able to uh, shut down the, the, the whatever system that the government is using to deliver services, to function. To, to. So cyber security is then important to every country. Uh, but also you have the issue of uh, data. Uh, because uh, in the process of doing all of what Singapore, for instance, and many, uh, some other countries are doing that as well, that uh, one of our panelists was describing, in the process of doing that, they are collecting a lot, they are in possession of a lot of uh, public uh, citizens' data, okay? And th this data, in a way, has to be protected. And protecting that also requires uh, cyber security. So I would say this would be central to every uh, digital initiative uh, that governments uh, are taking, whether developing countries or developed countries. And Pat, can, do you have thoughts on this, the cyber angle? I, I can't agree more. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think uh, especially in today's uh, very rampant social media world. I think not only governments, uh, any organizations that gets hold of your, your customers' data actually have the responsibility to make sure that you, you take uh, full accountability for making sure that the data stays safe with you. So we, we have uh, very, very strict uh, laws against uh, infringement of uh, cybersecurity and yeah, this is something which uh, we are constantly looking at. 
so for for the government for example we are quite wary about uh, cloud solutions because I always joke about you know when you have cloud solutions and if it rains and all the data gets flown all over the place uh, I cannot afford to have my prime minister's data uh, landing on anybody uh, a stranger's hands and all that so so we are quite uh, stringent and, and quite strict about it and I think we have a question from the audience here. Uh, just give Tracy one moment to come to the microphone, but Tracy, the floor is yours. I think the microphone's on. Thank you. Um, so my question uh, comes, it's, it's influenced by one of the questions in the, in the chat. Um, for citizens to actively participate in the policymaking arena, they need to at least have had their basic needs met. So what is it that governments can do to address that? And in particular, I think individuals are not all equal. We've talked about these gender gaps and the, um, the unequal opportunities that are being faced. So question to our panelists on how do we get to the basic needs and how do we address those gender gaps? Thanks. Is there anyone online who feels particularly interested in taking that one? Otherwise, I'm, I'll point to Ed. Why don't you start us off, Ed, and then we'll See if anyone wants to add on. OK. Uh, thank you. So I think the question that uh, Tracy asked, I mean, two dimensions of it, meeting the basic needs and also the gender aspects of it. So I think in terms of meeting that basic needs, I raised that issue earlier on, that the needs of citizens in many countries they are taking for granted. I think government just think, OK, we'll do economic policies, we build infrastructure, and so on and so forth. While Say in some countries, what citizens really need is they need security, then they need energy, and they just need government to get off their backs and let them do what they need to do. Okay? So it could be as simple as that. I've seen, for instance, in the context of uh, the lockdown, uh, COVID at the onset of it, that uh, citizens, I mean, governments were talking about so social distancing and so on and so forth. But what citizens want really is they need food and so on and so forth. Lockdown now prevents them from getting the food, and government has no way of getting the food to them. So really, you have uh, a, a kind of a gap between what citizens want and uh, uh, what government is providing. So most importantly, so it takes back to, I mean, it takes us back to this point I was putting on the table earlier on, that governments need to really, in different countries, understand what is it that citizens want, and then respond to that accordingly. No, don't just, they shouldn't just assume that we know what our citizens want. Uh, one of the panelists in the disruptive debate was saying that the expectations of citizens are changing. Okay, and that's what is creating the demand gap. So if governments are not listening, they just, you just look at what Sierra Leone or Brazil or Indonesia is doing or Singapore, and you are just doing that in your country without knowing what is appropriate uh, or what the citizens want, uh, then you create that uh, gap, which is part of what this report is addressing, that, okay, you want a transformation, it needs to be contextual. Then let's come back to the issue of gender. I think governments have been operating for a long time and they think, I mean, I mean, and the mode of that operation, the way things have been done for several decades, really didn't pay attention to gender issue and so and other aspects of diversity as well. Uh, so, I mean, in many countries, I should say in all the countries, but in many countries. Uh, so, what is then important is for every government to realize that, look, to really be able to achieve their maximum potential in terms of economic development, all segments of the society must be given opportunity. And they must be able to participate and contribute. It's just like we are, there are a number of us in the room now. If it's only one or two of us that can contribute, it's not as good as all of us having the opportunity to be able to contribute. And so when government then recognizes that, then design every their ways of operation, their budget, construction and so on and so forth to really bring this important gender dimension into it. We know, for instance, in government that what drives uh, a government or in a sense or what lubricates the will of government is really finance. And we know this is constructed through budget, whether you have MTEF before annual budget formulation and stuff like that. But if you put gender as something that is really central to this, 
uh, then it can influence different aspects of what government is doing, procurement in various expenditure, what you spend on, on social services that you recognize gender. And most importantly, again, you also, government must also have a way of monitoring, okay, how whatever is being done is also achieving the kind of tag, I mean, uh, 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 what they want to achieve with respect to gender. Uh, sens uh, sensitiveness. So, because whatever does not get measured and reported, people don't pay attention to them. I can go on, <laughs> but let me. No, no, it's fascinating. I just here in the last few minutes, I wanted to get to another question really quickly from from Laura Daniela Fala uh, on LinkedIn, and she's asking about the rising inflation. And and maybe Laura, you might be best placed to to answer this one because you were talking about the experience of Latin America in the first decade versus. Uh, in the previous decade. And, and uh, Laura Fala, she asks how governments can improve the huge inequality gaps and social discontent people have been experiencing after the COVID-19 crisis, especially in this context of, of rising inflation, rising rates, and, and uh, the, the kind of looming threat of stagflation on the horizon. Well, uh, once again, uh uh, here we will need to, uh, uh, to, to, to have a combination of different policies. Um, it has to be, for example, with uh, the tax policies, with the way we are going to spend uh, the limited resources we already have. Uh, this is, of course, is going to be about uh, putting at the center uh, those uh, factors that are creating even more uh, divisions or more gaps or are widening the gaps, for example, the access to digital technologies and very importantly, the issue of, uh, of women uh, who were the most impacted during the pandemic. But if you allow me, I would like to say something else about the gender gap. Of course. And because it is associated with something very important when we think about uh, policy designs. And that is values and, uh, and social norms. One of the most important lessons that I learned during my years working with governments is that change doesn't happen if citizens are not convinced of the importance of changing, and especially if they are unwilling to modify the attitudes to support the process. So that is why I think governments must move from policies that only seek to address people's demands and needs to policies that can also impact uh, people's attitudes and values. Uh, and, 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 and that is particularly important when we talk about how to tackle the gender gap. Because if we do not address the problem of social values through the policies we are going to implement, it doesn't matter what kind of specific policies we enact, we will continue women suffering discrimination. Uh, again, if the policies doesn't address the stereotypes. In fact, the, the report is very clear about this. Uh, the report, what it's saying is this problem is growing in many regions and in many countries. So once again, there are many specific policies that also policy has to be about changing the attitudes and the values of the people. Fantastic. Just as we uh, wrap up here, and, and we're a little bit over time, but, but just briefly, I'd love to hear from, from each of you. The Future of Government Initiative, it, it makes this urgent call for action to reimagine governments both inside and outside, from inside and outside. Uh, most of you have worked in government or you're still working in government. Uh, how can an individual, how can each of us here support changing government for good? And so maybe George, we'll start with you and then Laura, we'll jump back to you, Pat Kim, and then Ed, we'll, we'll finish uh, the, the morning with you. Well, two things are important uh, to me. One is to position oneself to listen. Listening is key. You can't help anyone without first listening to them. So listening is key. Uh, the, the second thing for me is stay engaged. Uh, be engaged, especially with the periphery. 
uh, the front lines of service, uh, where communities are most impacted, and be the one who brings people together, the one who helps people find solutions in a community. So listening to people and staying engaged, particularly with the front lines of service delivery, will be two keys uh, in helping people bring about the government of the future. Laura, do you want to jump in with some thoughts on how individuals themselves can, can be engaged? It's me. It's, hello, yeah. Um, look, this, this, this call to action uh, made by, uh, by you, by the World Bank in this report, I think is, is probably the most important. Uh, because uh, it is a recognition of the capacity of every individual to contribute to change. Uh, an invitation of, uh, for each of us to make a commitment uh, and to positively influence the transformation process that our governments must, uh, must uh, um, uh, undertake. Uh, in my case, I have the honor of being part of different kind of uh, global and regional initiatives uh, that are promoting reforms, reforms at the international and national levels. Uh, but also, I am in permanent contact with young people who are, according to my opinion, the most important change makers, the ones who can influence outcomes and achieve real change. In fact, they are moving uh, the sustainability agenda, the agenda against climate change, uh, faster than before. So I just can assure you uh, about my total commitment to support this call to action and to bring the message to the different audiences in which I interact. Fantastic. Pat, Kim, do you want to, to jump in on, on the role of the individual and advice for the individual? I... I... Uh, totally agree with Laura and for for an individual I would say you know being bold being willing to to experiment and thinking out of the box and uh, you know when when explore because the pace of disruption is going to continue to pick up and and we must be prepared to be innovative and to have differentiated solutions to our to our problems uh, because you know, a citizen who is a 60 year old and another citizen who is 60 year old, maybe same age, same gender, but their needs are very different. So how do we make sure that you know, our services and all that are not a one size fits all, but really customized to the level which is, um, which is what our citizens need and, and not what we want, not just what we want for them. And I think the big challenge is really um, to, to have that mindset shift of making sure that we hang on to this whole idea of, you know, have a common vision, a common goal, something we learned during COVID, we have to get out of this, uh, not only just survive, but get out of this, coming out of the, the crisis stronger. And, and, you know, the things that we have built, the collaboration, uh, working as a team, and really being willing to ask for help when you need. Uh, and it's the same for, as, as we all get very stretched, uh, one big emphasis that we were working on is on mental well-being. Okay, and we basically tell people, it's okay not to be okay, just get help. Okay, and then together we can come out of this stronger. So, yeah, be brave. <laughs> it's a lovely sentiment. Ed. Do you want to finish this off with your, your advice for individuals? Okay, thank you. Uh, so I agree with everything that has been said. So I'll say two things. One, I think as individuals, we should, in our respective uh, countries or wherever we find ourselves, really be calling for change uh, and be specific about what type of change we want. And we can do this using the various media that is available. And it can also be through organizations that we are involved in, uh, just influencing them to kind of put that on uh, or demand on government. So that's the first part. Then the second part is contributing uh, to the change process in terms of if there were 
the kind of crowdsourcing for ideas that panelists have talked about, uh, participating in that and contributing. Uh, but also beyond that, also uh, as part of this that citizens' uh, contribution, also monitoring what is happening in terms of how effective uh, the changes are, and what lessons are to be learned, and then also be ready to contribute uh, uh, to, in terms of providing feedback to government on what is working and what is not working in the change process. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, we're, we're pretty massively over time, and I don't want to get anyone in trouble, but thank you so much, Ed and, and Lopak Kim. Uh, George Warner and Laura Chinchilla, so much for being here. And thank you to everyone who's joined us online on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, World Bank Live. Really appreciate you spending the morning with us or afternoon, if depending on your time zone. Uh, if you want to check out the Future of Government report, you can find it on the World Bank website. Search for Future of Government. You can also go onto social media and look for the hashtag Future of Government. And you'll be able to find links and various resources there. But until next time, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll say goodbye now. <laughs>